Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because we have somebody on the show today who's gonna make sure you are actually sending the right signals. Jeff Grimshaw was actually born and raised in rural Southern Utah. He is the oldest of five. He has two two brothers and two sisters. Jeff's father, the first generation off the farm, was a third grade teacher and money was tight. The family didn't travel often, but some summers, his parents took the kids shopping for school clothes in the nearest big city, Las Vegas, which was 90 miles to the southwest. The culture of Las Vegas and the culture of Jeff's mostly Mormon hometown couldn't be more different and those differences fascinated him. He wondered why people in different communities know what they know, feel what they feel, and do what they do. He went, to, he went north to college to the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, where he earned degrees in organizational communication and political science. After graduation, he got recruited to a consulting firm in Philadelphia, where he developed statistical models for predicting customer behavior. When he had the chance to focus Instead, on organizational and employee research, he jumped at the opportunity. At some point, he realized his passion was less about running stats and more about figuring out what leaders need to do to move the needle on engagement, culture, and other metrics related to organizational performance and health. Jeff has lead authored two data-driven books that demystify challenging leadership topics in practical ways. Accountability, which is leadership without excuses, how to create accountability in high performance, Instead of Just Talking About It, published by McGraw-Hill in 2010, and two, Culture, Five Frequencies, Leadership Signals That Turn Culture into Competitive Advantage, published by Logos in 2019. Jeff is a principal at MG Strategy, where they help leaders measure and manage culture as a source of competitive advantage. The team is currently helping senior leaders on six continents. Jeff is married and, after more than 25 years in Philadelphia, now lives in rural Mount Gretna. His daughter is entering her freshman year at Penn College of Technology. Jeff Grimshaw, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Yeah, let's do it. Thanks, Jim. I, uh, I love the introduction. I felt like I was listening to my eulogy, but uh, it was pretty good. I, I hope my actual eulogy someday is, is, is uh, that flattering. Well, Jeff, I hope and pray that you're a heck of a way, a long way away from that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, me too. But I've given my legion a little bit about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? Yeah. So I I am a bit of a geek. I mean, in the sense that uh, I really, I was talking to a friend yesterday, actually the guy I wrote uh, 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 Leadership Without Excuses with 10 years ago. And he was saying that all his friends were saying, why aren't you golfing more? And he said, I don't really like golf. What I really like doing is the brain candy of helping clients solve tough challenges. And I said, I feel exactly the same way. It's, um, I feel like it, it beats having a real job brain candy of somebody being in a tough spot and applying some uh, uh, brain power to it and seeing if we can come up with practical solutions driven by data. So I'd like to tell you something cooler than that. But if I'm being honest, and I like to be honest, that's, that's really what I'm truly passionate about. Well, I think for me, I share some of those similar passions as far as being able to take evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And using that evidence uh, and asso- an association, you know, with other points of evidence, you know, and maybe some theoretical factors and, and, and research and insights that have been captured in other places and putting all this complexity together, you know, to try to find a way forward. I mean, it's, it's problem solving at its best, right? Using data. Uh, but then when you throw the human element in it, it's like you're making an impact in people's lives. I mean, for me, that's like, hey, that's getting to the point of bliss. Yeah, absolutely. Like case in point, Last Friday, I spent the day with uh, the senior team in the finance department. So the CFO and his team for the city of Detroit. And their stated goal is not only to be a great finance operation, their goal is to build the capability and the infrastructure so that Detroit survives 
the next recession. So, you know, talk about having a compelling challenge that you're working on that has an impact on tons of people. And of course, we're in the longest expansion in U.S. history. So at some point, we're going to have another recession. And so to have the opportunity to work on really gritty, important stuff like that is, uh, I, I just think, is uh, a, a real blessing. The Pete's getting frustrated out on the golf course. <laughs> uh, from my perspective, because I suck at golf, and uh, I, given a choice between those two things, uh, I know what I'd rather be doing. Yeah, most definitely. Okay, so fr Five Frequencies, uh, the recent uh, book that you, you have released that we're talking about, you know, talks about leadership signals that turn culture into competitive advantage. But I think for you – and focusing in on what you call the frequencies, and part of what you and I had talked about uh, prior to actually, you know, hitting the record button, you know, ha has to do with being able to connect all parts of the organization. And I think for me, that's why frequencies, when you start talking about that, kind of had some, you know, resonance. Mm -hmm. However, uh, let's pull everybody else into your thinking and talk to us a little bit about frequencies and, and why that contextual focus. Yeah, so... The idea is that, uh, you know, where does culture come from? Our research shows that whether they intend to or not, leaders are constantly transmitting signals across what we call the five frequencies, and that these signals are what creates culture. If you've got a great culture, it's because you've got strong and steady signals across these five frequencies. If your culture stinks and creates reputational risk and is hurting business performance is because what leaders have done, typically unintentionally, across those five frequencies, those signals that they are sending, again, whether they intend to or not. Well, of course, that leads us into you talking about what those five frequencies are, right? So get yeah, so, that into them. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, five frequencies. First way that you are sending signals and shaping culture, whether you intend to or not, is through your decisions and actions. Second is through what you reward and recognize. The third is through what you tolerate or don't tolerate. Fourth is how you show up informally. And what we mean by that is uh, in unscripted situations where, for example, you are with your team and you're not doing a town hall, you're not doing, you know, you're not working from a PowerPoint deck, it's not a presentation. So how you show up informally in conversation. And then the fifth frequency is formal communication. Lots of organizations have had the delusion that they're going to change their culture uh, with uh, just signals on highly, highly uh, polished signals on the fifth frequency formal communication. So they might make killer videos. They might have really nice uh, posters. But when you have signals on the fifth frequency that are divorced from the signals uh, on the other four frequencies, either people ignore it or worse, uh, make fun of those things because they're well aware of the gap between uh, frequencies one through four and, and what you're transmitting on frequency five. So when you start thinking about these frequencies, I would also have to start thinking about from an analytical perspective, you know, key drivers, right? You start yeah. at the, the variables and the, the independent variables and the dependent variables. And a lot of times we confuse causation and correlation, all of these data, you know, issues that we, we come up with. And so when you start talking about these five frequencies, what do you find you know, is one of the dependents that often drives a lot of these other variables? That's a great question. And this is actually what we do day in and day out is just to take half a step back. We're, I'm still in the statistical game. We, we help organizations measurably define their desired state culture. And we do that by saying, okay, so in a culture that gives you a source of competitive advantage, what do you need your people to consistently know and feel and do? And we help them figure out the top 15, 20 answers to that question. We get a baseline measurement. So now we know what they actually know, feel, and do. And we can, and we can see, okay, so now how do we close that gap between the culture you have and the culture you need? And uh, the, the signals that people, that leaders send across those five frequencies, they all have an impact. But there are two that have... I think a disproportionate impact in the most organizations. One is what do you tolerate or not tolerate? Frequency three. There's so many leaders who actually do a good job on the other frequencies, but their weak spot, their Achilles heel is they tolerate stuff they shouldn't tolerate. They don't like having unpleasant conversations or they go, I can't hold this person accountable because 
you know, he or she knows how to do some stuff and it would be too hard, or I'd like to performance manage them, but HR is going to give me a hard time or, or, so, or some other excuse they come up with. And it has really uh, significant downstream consequences. We see in the research that, uh, that high performers at some point start looking for the exits when they see that they're actually just giving, being more, they're given more work to do to make up for their leaders failure to hold uh, poor performance accountable. In other words, you know, the, the reward for winning the pie, con, eat, pie eating contest for high performers is you just get more pie. And eventually they go, that's not a culture I want to be part of. The second thing that has a disproportionate influence uh, on the ultimate, uh, on the outcome variables typically is how leaders show up on the fourth frequency, uh, how they show up informally. And this really gets to, are you showing up in a way where your team feels like you are part of their tribe? Not that you're best friend, not that it's not that uh, you're necessarily family or that you, uh, so that, you know, cause you've got to be able to hold them accountable, but do they feel like you are part of the same tribe? Because if you're part of the same tribe, that means that as an employee, you feel comfortable learning from mistakes instead of hiding them that you feel like you can constantly improve things, that you can speak up, that you can find ways to innovate, and that you're not just going to get shot down uh, by a leader who doesn't really uh, uh, want to listen to you. So, you know, they're all important, but those are two big ones that uh, leaders that are not obvious to everybody that just have a big impact uh, downstream on culture and on business performance. So for me, as you were explaining those, I started thinking about the one of the biggest drivers I think we all have as human beings, and that's the whole fear component. You know, I mean, yeah. the fear of the confrontation, the fear of losing, you know, something, and so therefore I just avoid it, which in and of itself compounds the problem. It doesn't fix the problem. And so there was actually something, for, so for me, as part of my mornings is I will, you know, get myself ready and, um, you know, watch a little bit of the news to kind of acclimate myself, uh, and then... Uh, I look at, you know, the particular stories that they're covering at a national level. And one of the stories that I was watching today was talking about partly of this issue, meaning that the reward or what is given to those that are the high performers is just yet more work. And so after a while, they just, like you said, they just kind of look around and say, well, wait a minute, I'm working my tail off. You know, right. I am carrying this torch for everyone and I have nobody to pass the baton to. So guess what? Sayonara, baby. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and there are organizations where just to be clear, everybody works their tail off. And if you look around and you see everybody else working their tail off, you go, this is pretty cool. I mean, you know, we're, we're all passionate about the work, but one of the things that, you know, I, uh, you, you know, and we, uh, I think we, we know from uh, neuroscience and, and evolutionary biology is that human beings are really uh, wired to uh, constantly monitor for inequity and for fairness. And so when we look around and we go, well, I'm working my tail off and other people are skating and getting the same rewards I am, maybe I just really like the job So, and I'm wired to work hard. So I'll do that for a while. I ain't doing that forever. I think you hit on something that's extremely important there is that whole inequity and fairness thing because we also know that we wanna be treated as an individual. And I think this is where kind of these frequencies come back into play and in talking about what I'm modeling and what I'm communicating is that we do have a diverse, you know, organization. We do have a diverse workforce and therefore there is going to be, you know, different, you know, expectations and, and different things that, you know, people are going to be, you know, uh, interacted with or provided or things like that. And it's going to cause what the, are those perceived you know, inequities when the, what therefore what they really are is customizations. But if we don't communicate it and appropriate and, and uh, therefore position it as such as part of our overall strategy, you know, and vision, people are going to draw their own conclusions. Right. Right. And I think the, um, and everybody is different, you know, everybody is different and that makes it hard to be a leader because uh, everybody has different emotional algorithms by which they process rewards what uh what you know is most rewarding for me could be different than what's re most rewarding for you or for the next person uh and so you know that's why leaders uh get paid the big bucks is because part of your job is to figure out how to motivate performance 
And that means that you have to spend time with people to understand some of the contours of their uh, emotional algorithms so that if they're doing great stuff, you, you know how to deliver that for them. You know, for example, is this somebody who is, who is going to feel more rewarded if you are spending time with them, if you are giving them great attention, or is the greater reward for them staying the heck out of their way? Uh, but you're not going to know unless, you know, there's no one size fits all. You're going to have to figure that out. Uh, and, and, but, but one of the things that we do know is that while everybody's different, everybody wants to be appreciated. Everybody wants to be appreciated. And so I think that's one of the most important things that people forget. If, uh, you know, you do have to manage for perceived inequity, uh, all the time, but if you're doing a lousy job of just showing people basic appreciation, uh, for doing good stuff, then they're going to be more, more, uh, attuned to, and, and, uh, uh, potentially triggered by perceived inequity than they are if you're just doing a great job of showing people on a day-to-day -day basis that when they're doing good stuff, even if it's in their job description, if they're doing good stuff, that you're demonstrating appreciation and saying thanks. Well, and as you're, as you're going through all this, I start thinking about, you know, uh, how I may be programmed or wired as a leader, what I've been conditioned to, what I've been exposed to, and then therefore that translates into, you know, my behavior. That translates into what I do when I'm not on stage, right? Uh, yeah. And so when you start thinking about being able to go through a transformation process, I mean, we're, we're talking about things that are extremely difficult for organizations to do. So like, for example, put it in context of frequencies is that I'm, you know, I've been broadcasting this way in this frequency for a very, very, very long time. How do I change what I'm actually broadcasting? Yeah, this happens a lot. Like I've been in two conversations in just the last week where leaders who are, you know, like middle-aged white guys like me uh, were in a room and they were complaining about how the millennials that work for them need all this attention and need all this reinforcement. They need validation. They need new experiences. They need novelty. And that's not, uh, you know, and I didn't need that when I was growing up in the organization. And uh, and they might be right, and it might be frustrating, but you know what? You, you sort of have to confront reality. I mean, it's, uh, people don't always like it when I quote Machiavelli, but there was, a, there was a thing that Machiavelli said in The Prince. He said, he who neglects what is done for what, or what should be done for what is done sooner affects his ruin than his preservation. And what he meant by that is if you sit around talking about, well, people should just feel motivated by this. Well, people should just do that or the other thing. In Machiavelli's words, you're, you're sooner affecting your ruin than your preservation because what we should focus on is what people are actually doing, not what they should be doing uh, based on the way that you grew up in the world. Okay, so that leads me to believe, um, you know, that there, there's oftentimes uh, inability to see that most important frequency that we're broadcasting if we're talking about, you know, having an organization that, perseveres, overcomes, achieves, and excels, is that we have an innocent victim in all of this dysfunction and, you know, inability to pick up and broadcast in the right way, um, is that's the customer. So when you start looking at, you know, the customer impact in these five frequencies, you know, do you find certain things that kind of stand out? I mean, I know you hit and said that third frequency is the most important, but is that the one that oftentimes the customer feels the most as well? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think I think for that one, I'm, I mean, it's probably true. But as you were asking the question, the first thing I thought of is um, uh, is really frequency for and how leaders show up informally. And here's why I say that. Uh, right now, I'm working with a big global pharmaceutical company, and they are working to become more customer centric. And what that really means is how do we get more medicines to more patients faster? And they realize that. They're an incredibly successful organization. They have so much to be proud of right now. But they also think we're big, we can be bureaucratic, uh, we could be a heck of a lot more agile. And uh, one of the things that they have uh, uh, committed to is the idea that if you want to have a more agile organization, a more customer-focused organization, then you have to have an operation, uh, an operation or organization that, that gives people a heck of a lot more trust. You have to have an organization where people can fail fast and learn from it instead of hiding mistakes. 
you have to have an organization where mistakes become intellectual capital. You have to have an organization where we constantly reserve the right to get smarter. Hey, we said we were going to do this, but instead of doubling down on something that isn't working very well, let's reserve the right to get smarter and, and rapidly experiment with something else. And people are only willing to do that in an organization where they trust their leaders and they feel like their leaders trust them. The only way to make that happen is, again, is if leaders are getting out there and operating as coaches as opposed to a strict command and control organization where it's, you know, bring me that rock or bring me a rock and then people freak out and go into you know, committees trying to figure out the rock that they're supposed to bring back to the boss. So, I mean, it's that all important trust component. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so when, when I start thinking about a journey, a pathway, uh, transformation, you know, it, and you, you talking about the agile component, that's just, you know, one of the approaches yeah. uh, that will help with the whole transformation process. Uh, but when you start looking at the timeline and the expectation, because I think this is important, because when we start thinking about the frequency element, I'm having to modulate, I'm having to adjust, having to do all of that. And, you know, I oftentimes have baggage that I, you know, and miscommunication that I've had in the past, I had to fix. What do people expect as far as, you know, an impact and effect when I start getting and broadcasting the right way and having things received the wrong way versus what really happens? So in other words, to give you kind of context is that um, many, many, many years ago, my wife and I bought uh, an older home. And so we did a walkthrough, knew it had to be rehabbed. And so she looked around and she said, so how long will it take for you to remodel this stuff? Three weeks? And I and two years later, I finally finished. <laughs> what is the what is the expectation versus the reality? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the uh, the we have seen cultures transformed, and not just like anecdotally, like like we measure culture. You know, we measure culture for organizations. So we have seen organizations absolutely transform in eighteen months. Uh, we have seen leadership experiments where uh, where we go from a baseline to a measurement four months later and they've really moved the needle because they uh, an entire leadership team really took seriously broadcasting different signals across the five frequencies and we see statistically significant differences three or four months later but that's not transformation that's just moving the needle in the right direction so really 18 months is the best case scenario and I have to add I'm sad to say we have had clients who uh, were under a lot of pressure, for example, from a board to make a bad culture good. In 18 months, we had results that showed that the culture was really night and day difference. They prematurely declared victory. And uh, one year later, they're pretty much back where they started because they, you know, they, they took their foot off the gas. So big cautionary tale. It, you know, you just have to treat culture. If you, most, most leaders say absolutely culture is important. And most leaders, you know, they're, they're, they don't think it's provocative when we say that culture is either an asset or a liability. It can be a source of competitive advantage. But what do you do with everything else that is a really important to business? You measure it and you manage it. So why would you treat culture that way? Lots of organizations, uh, you know, like the idea, but they don't quite have the appetite. Well, but it's hard work. It is hard work. And with hard work, I mean, we, we need things to continually help to, you know, give us a boost and reinforce us. And, and one of the things that we look at on the show to help us do that are quotes. Uh, so is there a quote or two that you like that you can share? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was telling you about Greg Barron, my, my co-author on Leadership Without Excuses, the book on accountability that we, we wrote uh, 10 years ago. And he has two quotes that uh, I love, and one of them is, uh, your greatest source of power as a leader is the ability to change the way people feel. And honestly, when he, I first heard him saying that, I was like, dude, that sounds like the lyric to a Johnny Mathis song. I mean, that's so, uh, that's so soft and fuzzy. And I, you know, I was unenlightened 20 years ago, and, and then when, um, when I started getting into behavioral economics, and uh, uh, when uh, uh, and, and when you know the the big discovery was that most economic choices uh, are actually based on uh, emotional algorithms. I was like, dude, actually, you were right all along. He was like, yeah, no kidding. The second quote is um, from him: 
uh, that I, I quote him all the time is everything that happens in an organization happens in or because of a conversation. So if you want to change something in an organization, it means you've got to change the conversation. And a lot of the work that I'm doing with senior teams is really at a basic level. We, we can call it strategic planning. We can call it culture. We can call it anything you want. But in a lot of cases, it's really about how do we change the conversation? the conversation that you as a leadership team are having, and then how do you change the broader conversation uh, in the organization, knowing that really that's the, that's the leverage point where everything happens. Well, but that's not a good marketing message. <laughs> that's a terrible marketing message. <laughs> <laughs> well, needless to say, I mean, you talked about right there, you know, a time where you got all the hump in regards to your mindset and what you were thinking and perceiving. And those, you know, moments can be very valuable to us and others can learn from them. Can you think of a time where you've actually had that, in addition to that, that you can share that you've got over the hump? Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to go back to my buddy Greg Barron again because, you know, I, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, the, my firm, MG Strategy, is, is kind of an interesting firm, I think, because the four principles were all part of, of another firm at one point. I'm not going to say the name, but we were all part of another firm and we all kind of had a Jerry Maguire moment where we said, we love what we do. We just don't like the culture we're part of. And so, you know, we took the goldfish proverbially, proverbially and started our own firm. But I put that off for a long time. And my buddy Greg Barron had said to me for a few years, dude, you, you treat your life like it's a dress rehearsal for the real thing. And honestly, when I was in my 30s, I was like, that is a good saying. I'm going to write that down and say it to other people. But I didn't actually take it to heart. And then, you know, and this is over 10 years ago, when all of a sudden it was like, I'm turning 40. I was like, holy crap. Uh, he was right. I have been treating my life like it's a dress rehearsal for the real thing. I actually need to make some tough decisions. So, you know, that's a big existential moment and probably not like the day-to-day -day, uh, Wednesday hump that you're thinking of. But still, I think when you're facing a hump, whether even if it's a small thing, I, I go back to what Greg said, are you treating your life like it's a dress rehearsal uh, for the real thing? And sometimes that's the catalyst to put things into perspective and, and do something different. Well, I think that's exactly what we're looking for because cool. when you start thinking about humps and for us, and I think all of us would say that, you know, some were significantly bigger than others, right? And ultimately, when we start talking about as adults, how we learn the most, it's in community of one another. And, you know, by sharing our stories, I mean, I mean, all of those things, you know, can really help us to self reflect and to say, ah, oh, am I in dress rehearsal? So right. Hearing that. Well, when I think about you know, what you're doing, the work that you're doing, you talk, even talk about, you know, the city, you and I talked about a couple industry verticals as well. Yeah. Prior to us recording. But when you, when you start looking at, you know, where, where you're headed, where you're going, uh, what, what is one of your goals? Uh, great question. I think uh, one of my goals is to uh, expand, you know, one of the things that, that uh, we, we spent a lot of time, you and I talked about utility companies. Um, my first, you know, my first consulting gig was uh, with a utility company and 26 years later, uh, they're still, this, they're still a client. I was there yesterday. Uh, and, uh, but um, I also just, one of the things that we found last year was uh, we have, was the model works universally, honestly. A year ago, I could have, I, I didn't know for sure whether uh, five frequencies was really just something that made the most sense in uh, English speaking countries in North America. Uh, but uh, over the last year, we now have leadership experiments uh, going on on uh, six continents. Um, I'd like to, you know, I have been to Antarctica, uh, but we don't have any uh, uh, leadership experiments going on there with the five frequencies. Uh, so I think a lot of it is just about because I'm all about brain candy. One of my goals is to be able to just keep uh, going after new kinds of organizations and experimenting with the model and uh, and seeing what works and recalibrating what it doesn't, which is, of course, what we're always asking our, our clients to do. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Thank you. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. 
An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Jeff, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Jeff Grimshaw, are you ready to hoedown? I'm going to say yes. I'm, I'm feeling a little trepidation, but I hope I do a good job here. Yes, I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Uh, you, you'll be great. Okay, so what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? I mean, for like for anybody else, I think it's uh, self-limiting beliefs. Uh, I think it's about uh, really understanding what are the beliefs that are motivating the choices that you make. Awareness precedes choice. Choice precedes change. So uh, it's about being aware of the beliefs that are driving behavior and then shifting beliefs where that's appropriate. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? I'm going to go back to what I said before, which is awareness precedes choice and choice precedes change. And what? That's another Greg Baronism, by the way. So now I'm up to four quotes for him. I'm going to call him after I'm done with this podcast and give him some love and tell him that uh, tell him how much he's profoundly influenced me because uh, uh, I'm uh, running out of fingers to count my Greg Barron quotes on this podcast. Well, my, and most definitely you need to tell Greg he needs to be one of our guests on the Fast Leader Show, that's for sure. So what do you feel is one of your secrets that helps you be successful in business or life? In our firm, we have an informal okay. mantra, and that mantra is uh, always be smart, never be an a-hole and uh, try to do cool things and you'll always be in business and you'll always be happy. I don't know if that's uh, actually, you know, a hundred percent true or guaranteed to work all the time, but for us and our firm, that's been working really well for 11 years and we started in the Re great recession. And what do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you be successful? Uh, you know, we, we use the, we use the, uh, we use a tool called, what do you want people to know, feel, and do? That's how we get organizations to a leadership desired state culture. Uh, but it's a useful tool for communication. A lot of times, if you're going into an important meeting, if you stop before you go into that meeting, and you go, okay, what are my outcomes? Forget about my talking points. What are my outcomes here? Who am I talking to? And if this is a successful meeting, what I want them to know and to feel and to do as a result of the way I show up and communicate, then you can be outcomes focused uh, when you go into the conversation. Uh, lots of people swear by that tool. And what do you feel is one of your favorite books uh, of all time? And of course, we're going to put a link to five frequencies on your show notes page as well. All right. Well, I talked a lot about Greg Barron, but one of my other mentors in life is a guy named Bill Adams. And along with Bob Anderson, he wrote a book in the last year called Scaling Leadership. And uh, it's also just incredibly data based. I mean, there's a million data points, literally a million plus data points that went into that book that shows uh, really wh what do you need to do to be a, a successful leader in an environment of volatility and uncertainty, uh, which most of us are facing. I mean, that's what fast leadership is about. And even though the book is driven by data, it's super accessible. It came out in the last year and I was going to read it because Bill's my mentor. And I, so I said, okay, it might take me a year to read this book, but I owe it to Bill to read his book. And I read the whole darn thing in like a Saturday morning. It's a good book. I actually had Bob Anderson on the phone oh, cool. on the show as well. And, and, and they put together some phenomenal work. That's for sure. So we'll put that on your show notes page as well. And fast cool. Leader legion, you can actually find more information when you go to Jeff's show notes page, which will be at fastleader.net slash Jeff Grimshaw. Okay, Jeff, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25, and you have the opportunity to take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? Yeah, I, I think it actually, uh, it goes to the, the crux of what Bob Anderson's and, uh, and Bill Adams' research is about. That the one thing that's changed my life is their whole theory around you can be either in creating mode or you can be in reacting mode where you've got something to prove 
or you can be creating stuff that's really important to you, outcomes that are important to you and your family, but you probably have to pick where you're gonna put your best energy. If I had had that paradigm in my head uh, when I was 25, I would have avoided a lot of mistakes and been a lot happier and been a lot more successful, but I'm darn glad that I have had that paradigm firmly rooted in my head for the last 10 years. Jeff, I've had a great time with you, but can you tell our Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. We have a book website that's called fivefrequencies.com, and you can either put the numeral five or you can spell out uh, the word five, fivefrequencies.com. And when you get there, you can download for free the book's introduction so you can try before you buy. And uh, lots of folks are using the book. We, they've told us in their uh, business book clubs or leadership book clubs. And so we also have a discussion guide uh, that you can download, obviously, uh, for free as well. So I hope, uh, hope folks will check it out. Jeff Grimshaw, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. <laughs>